Nigeria's government started a policy to introduce PPP into the management of our recreational facilities, parks, gardens. Uh, very central or core at that particular point is the Eburi Botanical Gardens, which is in your constituency. What assurances will you get from you that you assist your minister to expedite work so that the, the rate at which we are losing this, our parks and recreational grounds and things will be made in order to facilitate um, all these things we talk about, spatial planning and the rest? Yes, indeed, it's true that we've done a lot of work on the gardens. I remember when you were Deputy Minister at the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development. The whole committee was set up to look at ways of bringing investors. Well, I understand we got to a point where some investors were secured, more or less. We were supposed to sign an MOU and then see how we could bring them on board to do this whole brigade thing, which is very central to our tourism and our botanical history, everything. Um, hopefully and thankfully, but my minister also has bought into this idea. The best thing would be for her to review it or get a technical team to review it and see whether indeed we can continue from there or we have to start all over again. That would be the ministry's policy. They have to review what has been done. But because it's my constituency, I have special interest in that, and I hope that all things being equal, sooner than later, we we'll get the right team to look at the brigadiers and bring it back to his glory. Fiscal decentralization has become a problem, and it's affecting full-scale decentralization, because people believe that you cannot decentralize the part of the agencies without fiscal decentralization. What would be your view in assisting the minister to lobby? for this particular aspect of our decentralization in order for us to achieve full-scale decentralization? It's one of the main features of decentralization. If you are supposed to um, send resources to the local level, and of course, that's the key part. But obviously, we don't seem to have achieved the ultimate. Indeed, if you even look at GIFMIS, the use of GIFMIS has been hampered by even lack of um, equipment and technology, etc. But in every budget, you find that the government is very particular about fiscal decentralization. So I know that with the new minister in place and with his, with his team, and what I've seen in the budget is something that hopefully by next year's budget, we would have moved forward. Because at every point, we seem to see that as a hindrance towards full decentralization or optimum decentralization. So I believe that this government will work on it. It will become a major part of the whole decentralization policy that we are pursuing. Having dissolved to the MMDA levels, but still, some department agencies as who are holding on to their sector ministries and things, and they've not been able to dissolve themselves into the local administration. What will you do to make sure that all department and agencies that are supposed to be decentralized to the MMDAs are effectively uh, done? The minister in this direction. But I believe that with the new act, the Local Governance Act, Act 936. We have extensive provisions on this aspect. Beyond that, I think that the Interministerial Coordinating Committee will play a major role in explaining to the other departments that it's in our interest that they are fully integrated under the local governance system. The LI 1961 um, made in 2009 uh, is in existence. But we have been a bit slow in implementing it. I believe that with the new act and with the new team and the fact that now the IMCC is fully recognized under the law, 
we'll be able to move forward because other sectors are at the highest level, the president chairing such a committee, or his rep, with all the various ministers as part of the committee, to be easier for us to all agree that this is the way to go. And I believe we'll make progress this year. Deputy Minister Nomini. Honorable, my question is, what advice would you give to your minister uh, in, on the tenure of the presiding members of the assemblies? Do, they, do you think we have to expand it to meet the four year or they stay? Thank you. Situation is a two year tenure, which, which is renewable. Um, I haven't heard much uh, discussion on it, but of course some would wish that at least it should coincide with the term of the um, DC or MC. So obviously if we need to amend, we then have to look at the provisions um, involved in this particular aspect. But as of now, it's a two-year thing and it doesn't appear to be a major issue for for the local governance sector. But of course, the discussion can be put on board. And my minister is very capable and able. I'm sure if she has to lead a discussion, all of us will follow and see how best we can address the situation. But it's a bit odd in the sense that the presiding is selected for two years and then the term ends. And you have to find out whether we should continue. But sometimes we. It's because the time for electing the presiding is different from the time for electing the DC, and you have to find a way to make sure that there's some um, congruence, if I should put it that way. I, I'm not required to state my personal position here, but the reality is that if you look at the Constitution under Article 240, um, we all agree that if there should be actual participation at the local level, then those who represent us should be elected. So you have even unit committee members being elected. We come to assembly members, they're elected. We come to the member of parliament, he's elected. But when it comes to the DC, it's by appointment. Of course, the prior approval of the two chairs of members of the assembly. I think the time has come. Incidentally, for the major parties, MPP and DC, we all agree that these officers should be elected. As to how it should be done, it's another matter. For instance, the Constitutional Review Commission strongly recommended that such officers should be elected. But when it came to the government white paper issued by the NDC government, the view was that even though we accept that there should be election, we prefer that the president will nominate um, five persons um, for the Public Service Commission to look at these five persons, and three of them would then be presented to the um, electorate for one of them to be elected. As to whether that is what was emphasized under the Constitution Review Commission, it's another matter. Now, MPP has come in, and we are saying that by the next assembly elections, which should be September 2019, because the last one was September 2015, we are saying that by 2019, September, we should be able to elect DCs, MCs, alongside Chairman, sorry. assembly members. Are you the electoral commissioner of Ghana? No, the, the law is there, four-year term, and the last election was 1st September 2015. We cannot go beyond four years. So by deadline, 2019 September, we should have our elections for assembly members. And, and you are MPP, determining dates for the electoral commission so established under Article 14. No, I'm not determining dates. I haven't said that at all. You, you were elected on 7 December 2016. So it's obvious that if you want to go again, December 2020, you should stand for lessons. The date uh, is, Chama, is I know fixed. that the C 
senior of senior deputy ministers <laughs> knows and respects the law, and therefore he must respect the independence of the commission. Uh, uh, honorable ranking member, he is only deducing from the law. He is not making any rule. Deducing that in every four years, as the law stipulates, they would have election. So, yeah, he is not fixed a date for election. No, I'm fine if he says 2019. By ahead September. Yes, I'm saying that the last elections were held on 1st September 2015. And if the term is four years, then September 2019, we should have the next elections. The MPP is saying that by that time, we should be ready to have elections for DCs. Now the issue is... The government is saying... The government the, is saying, yes. Not the MPP government. But you accept that you are senior deputy minister. <laughs> yeah. I see that you enjoy yourself. Oh. Well, so, <laughs> yes, so Mr. Chairman, that is what it is. Now, the major issue, the same question was asked when the Honorable Minister was here before the committee, as to whether I should be partisan or non-partisan. The major issue is that under Article 55, it's stated clearly that Parties can sponsor candidates for any elections in the country except the district assembly elections and unit committee elections. And that provision is entrenched. So indeed, if you want to amend for this, um, DCs to be elected on party lines, then we have to go for a referendum as far as Article 55 is concerned. The other articles, 243, 248, they are not entrenched. And if you want to amend, we can go through the procedure. But that's what it is. So we still have some years ahead of us. The minister and her team and the presidency, I'm sure, we will look at it and see how best we can present this to the people of Ghana so that we meet the deadline of 2019. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> the MDP manifesto is saying something. Very, very good thing that they are saying. And it's about ensuring that more resources, and in fact, they praise themselves for uh, increasing the, the common fund from 5% to 7.5%. Unfortunately, the recent budget that we are still yet to approve is capping it to 5% again. How can you do a good thing and you want to build the capacity of district assemblies, give them more resources to develop? And we are now saying, let's roll back to what the Constitution says we should give. Are you going forward or you are going backwards? Deputy Minister. Chairman, the... <laughs> My good friend, Honorable Ilechire, was one time Minister for Local Government and Rural Development. Well, and I'm sure we all agree that when it comes to sending resources to the districts, it's not only the common fund. Indeed, under this government, if we look at the budget, various projects have been earmarked for the districts. One state, one factory, resources will go there. The eradication of poverty in the rural areas, resources will go there. Even for the inner city and Zogo development, we are sending funding there. And then, of course, the industrialization that we are talking about will also come in. There are just one dam, one village, or one village, one dam. All these things would go to the local units. So it's not that because you have capped it at at least 5%, they will be depriving those units of any resources. Indeed, more resources will be pushed there. If you remember, we are also talking about every constituency having $1 million every year. So all these things would inure to the benefit of the districts. And to not be like we are starving the districts, when at the same time we are talking about eradicating poverty and creating jobs um, uh, the famous one, which will be rolled out recently, uh, very soon, so of course planting for food and jobs. Yes. 
Mr. Chairman, the Deputy Minister has tried to explain this away. But he knows that sanitation is no longer part of the ministry. Inner cities are no longer part. Zongos are no longer part. Then there is a, a, a ministry for creating regions called regional reorganization. I mean, if you say all that, these resources you are talking about, are they going to be under the direct supervision and of the ministry? And if they are located elsewhere, how are you sure that these will go to further decentralization? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, obviously, these resources will be sent to the district. They will not go anywhere apart from going to the districts. Then number two, even though um, we've created the inner cities and zongos um, sector, water and sanitation, etc., these sectors would have to go through transition. I don't think overnight you can say that you're going to run the whole thing without local government giving the support and direction and everything. So the Ministry of Local Government will still be involved in some of these major projects, simply because they go to their districts and their districts directly report to the Ministry of Local Government. It's not a matter of turf war. We are going to collaborate and coordinate to make sure that, indeed, these resources get there and they are well managed. Because we have the annual action plans, we have the medium-term plans, and we have a composite budget. All these things would have to be factored in and then directed well so that there's no duplication and then we are not saddled with um, good programs which will not be implemented. So rest assured that local government is still very central in all these things. Manifesto on page 142 says, and I quote, under fiscal decentralization, A, I don't want to read the rest of the things because it starts with MPP. It starts with MPP. What it says, in, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that MPP will ensure that the fiscal decentralization is fully implemented through the following initiatives. A, abolishing the current practice of central government manipulation of DASF, CF, through the procurement process. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Deputy Minister, Senior Deputy Minister designate, how are you going to make sure that this is, what is the manipulation in the first place, and how are you going to abolish it? I would advise the minister, that's the first thing. I am not going to implement it, that's my able minister. But if you read it carefully, the major complaint from the assemblies is the fact that before the fund is sent to them, a chunk of it is deducted from source here. And sometimes they even send them things that they may not have requested for. If the assembly needs a tractor and you send them a payloader or a grader which they have not requested for, by the time the money gets there, it's been deducted as source. And we think that it's crippling some of these assemblies. So as much as possible, as far as procurement is concerned, if procurement could be done at a local level, it will minimize some of these things where um, about a third of what you are supposed to receive would have been taken away before it even gets there because of some of these procurement practices. And obviously, every, every um, I don't know the word I want to use, but every honest DC or assembly member would confess or would confirm that some of these things have not helped the assemblies at all. So if we have put it in our manifesto and the minister is ready to drive it, we look at all those options and as much as possible reduce the, the, the deductions, the huge deductions at the center. A typical example, even my district, you know, it used to be municipality, Krapim South municipality, then it was, the district was created out of it. And then they were saddled with 
items that they had not asked for. But they had been given those items. And they were supposed to, supposed to pay for them. As a new district, that's not what was their major need as at that time. So some of these things, we need to look at them and address them. I think this is the best way that has been captured in the manifesto. It's not only in the manifesto, it's in the Local Governance Act that a minister may by ally um, make regulations as to what assembly members and presiding should receive. So as soon as the, there's some money in the kitty, I'm sure the minister will take the lead and then look at this thing which has been hanging for a very long time. My friend Ovi, <laughs> time changes. <laughs> Ovi, congratulations. Uh, we are talking about the ability of the disassemblies to generate revenue, but it seems to me that in most of the rural districts assemblies, they depend solely on the common fund. If you take Bodhi this assembly, for instance, you could see that the assembly is struggling to survive if the common fund doesn't go because economic activities are just absent. So what will you do to ensure or to suggest to your minister that you do about this particular problem because it is killing most of the rural assemblies? This has been an issue for quite some time. And indeed, if you read the literature, on paper, we seem to have all the solutions to some of these problems. But the reality is that some of the districts were created without what we may call the economic viability. But for political reasons, they have to be created, and some have been created. The, of course, if you don't have major economic activities there, it will be difficult to even get your own IGF. But the option is to create the environment for investors, for people to be able to um, get involved in economic activities, and then also to enhance the capacity of the administrators on the ground as to how to raise resources at the local level. Because some DCs give the impression that they are there to wait for common fund so that they can run the districts. If you ask them what they have in mind as to be able to raise their own resources, some of them don't seem to even appreciate it or even have the capacity to do this. So we need to raise the capacity of some of these DCEs and also get involved. As MPs, we all need oh, to get well, involved. Um, beyond that, yeah. looking around, if you know, would you agree that some of the districts have no activities that are taxable? That is it. But as I said, once they've been created and we haven't abolished them, we have to have find solutions. For instance, citing a market there, would it raise the resource value of the district? For instance, as, as I said, bringing investors there will help. But there are some districts, they have gold right in front of them, but they don't go for it. For, come to my constituents with all due respect. We have mansions, huge mansions in Embry, but how many of them are approached for them to even pay their rates? So some, they can make it, others too, we have to help them. But I'm saying that it should be a concerted effort. But on paper, we seem to have all the solutions. So the rest is for us to implement, to make sure that some of these issues come up. If it means um, government coming in, and then also this whole PPP idea, moving it a bit forward to put in the framework legislation to be able to help some of these distressed districts. Chairman, I'm compelled to come on a uh, follow-up to this uh, question because I'm aware that the nominee is a very diligent member of parliament. 
that in the budget statement and even when your minister moved the motion, there was reference to national address infrastructure and its digitalization as a consequence of wanting to track this property rate. Will you assure this committee that you will support its effective implementation and pro provide us with timelines if you do consult with your minister uh, on this takeoff? Thank you. The minister herself. <laughs> but certainly, uh, it goes without saying that that's the way to go. And my minister is fully supportive of that. So the rest of us, we are just supposed to assist her to achieve this um, goal. Article 252 of, of the 1902 Constitution. Uh, with your permission, I want to read. Subject to the provisions of this Constitution, Parliament shall annually make provision for the allocation of not less than 5% of the total revenues of Ghana to the district assemblies for development. And the amount shall be paid into the district assemblies common fund in quarterly installments. I want to find out from Nomni whether or not he will support any move to undermine this provision, or he will guide it jealously. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No, no, no. I don't understand. Uh, hold on. That, that's not a question I'll admit. Because he has no choice. We swear to uphold the Constitution. And once it's in the Constitution, he has no choice. He dares not undermine it. So that is a given. Please ask him another question. So, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, can the, let, let me, uh, let me, if the chairman will permit me. No, I'll try and uh, improve your question. <laughs> if I have your permission, uh, Obi Amwa, we know you are an ad adherent to the law and the provisions of Article 252, as my colleague have referred to, emphasizes total revenue. I know you are familiar with the Interpretation Act. Will you construe total revenue to be the same thing as tax revenue? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we all agree that if the Constitution says at least 5%, then no government can go below the 5%. Indeed, beyond the Constitution, if you look at the Local Governance Act 2016, Act 936, Section 126 has given us more or less a formula for arriving at this minimum 5%. And if we go through it, it's obvious that under this particular budget, if you do all the calculations, the budget meets the requirements under Article 252 of the Constitution. If I may be allowed to read, Mr. Chairman, Section 1261 says, Parliament shall annually allocate not less than 5% of the total revenue of the country to the disassemblies for development. And the two says, the total revenues of the country includes the revenues collected by or accruing to the central government, other than foreign loans and foreign grants, non tax revenue, Petroleum revenue paid into the Petroleum Holding Fund under Section 3 of the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, Act 815, and revenues already collected by or for district assemblies under any enactment. So, before you can arrive at the requirement, you should be able to take this into consideration. And speaking to the finance people, those who have run the ministry before, we all sat down, we calculated and we saw that indeed it's above 5%. So I don't think that anybody is undermining the provision in the Constitution. Mr. Chairman, the Honorable Nominee is now going through the process to become a Deputy Minister of State. And per the standing orders, 
if this committee turns out this of parliament, if this committee does not recommend you by consensus, it means that parliament will vote. And if we're able to secure 50% of the votes, you are passed. But when you go to the local uh, assemblies, especially the confirmation of DCEs, the constitution says that the DCE should have to test of the assembly, to test. And this is creating a lot of challenges for us when we are confirming DCEs. How do you, how do you say this? Is it possible we can do something about it? Very well. It's, it's an issue because sometimes we wonder what's the point in just repeating rounds of elections just to be able to get the nominee to get it to test. Some have advocated that it should be simple majority. And I think it's, it's in order. Except that then we have to look at the law. It's, it's in the Constitution and it's in the Act. We have to see how we can then amend these provisions to be able to look at how flexible it will be to elect um, our DCs and MCs. My first question has to do with comments you made, statements you made in Parliament on the 7th of December 2015 about the budget of the local government ministry. And I must say that reading up on you, you have been very consistent and very passionate about the local government ministry, and I commend you for that. You said in column 1379 of the official report, 7 December 2015, of the parliamentary debates, quote, Mr. Speaker, apart from the fact that our MMDAs are not being run well, the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development appears to be retrogressing, given the fact that for all these years, we depend on donors to fund our programs. And when they do not bring the funds, we are stuck, unquote. The 2017 budget, this year's budget, your government has even done worse than what you complain about, where 85% of the budget for the local government ministry is donor funded. Will you say that will you say that your government is retrogressing? Will you be consistent that your government is undermining the local government ministry, seeing that this practice has been repeated in the twenty seventeen budget? Well if you go through the records and the facts, this year is better than previous years. One if you look at even the 85% donor driven, it's less than last year, which was 90% or more. The records are there. Two, if you look at GOG allocation to Ministry of Local Government, there's 41% increase this year as compared with last year and previous years. The records are there. I can make them available to you. We've done analysis from 2013 at least till now. And the figures this year, even though we may say that it's not as much that we expected. It's better than previous years. So as far as I'm concerned, this year we are not retrogressing. We will make more gains as we go on. I wasn't expecting any different. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my second question has to do with uh, a matter which all of us are concerned as a country, and it's the, topic, the most topical issue now, uh, the destruction of our environment, illegal mining, galamse. Many believe that if the assemblies do their work, if effective decentralization happens, we don't even need the Lands and Natural Resources Minister or the Science and Environment Minister to come from Accra or any tax force to come from Accra to help save our environment. How do you propose that we can find a new order in making sure that the assemblies and the structures within the assemblies at the district, the local level, help us fight this menace, which really is, uh, is, is now uh, at 
alarming proportions, endangering lives, destroying our environment, and we don't know if we'll continue to live. You know all the statistics. Ghana Water Company saying we have to import water in 10 years, CSIR research, and all the other institutions. How can the local government ministry help us to fight this menace? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm aware that already there's a ministerial committee on this matter. And indeed, the Minister for Local Government, Honorable Minister for Local Government, is part of this committee, which is seriously looking at this issue and how to address it. So that's one major step. The other thing is, when we say Galamse, is it, do they have permit or do they don't have permit? And if they have permit, where is the permit coming from? Is it from the center or from the district? If the district will have to play a role in this, then it means we have to strengthen the district and empower them. Indeed, if you look at the Local Governance Act, the minister is supposed to make regulations as to how people even secure permits to operate in the districts. So obviously, my minister will look at it and see whether that will assist in addressing this issue. But we should all admit that sometimes it's not the district with that kind of power to be able to grant some of these licenses. Unless, of course, the person is operating illegally there, then the next step will be that, would the district have the resources to be able to counter such operators? Or do they have to call for reinforcement from the center? So all these issues are on the table. And I believe the way my minister and the other ministers have taken up the matter, we would assist in ensuring that um, we go by the law, and those who flood the law would have to face the music.